Good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to another video of the series Shankar Summary. But before getting into the discussion, I have two important announcements to make. One is regarding our Hindu daily news analysis. The series will commence from 15th of May 2023. Stay tuned and keep supporting us as always. The second thing that I wanted to share is about the free All India mock test of Shankar IAS Academy. There are three tests and these tests will be conducted on three dates that is 7th of May, 14th of May and 21st of May. So these tests will be simulated based on UPSC standards and answer keys will be provided at the end of each of these tests. So the registration link is given below. Click the link and register for the test. Dear aspirants, gear up and get ready for your D-Day. So with this note, now we will begin the discussion. So these are the list of topics that I have taken from the December 2022 current affairs. Now we will take up the first question for our discussion. Look at this question. This question is about the Vice President of India. Here four options are given and we have to find which one of these options is incorrect about the Vice President of India. Let us take option A. It says that as per Article 64 of the Indian Constitution, the Vice President of India acts as the ex officio chairman of Rajya Sabha. This option is correct. First of all, know that Article 63 of the Indian Constitution provides for the office of Vice President of India. Then the Article 64 provides that the Vice President of India shall be the ex official chairman of the Council of States that is the Rajya Sabha. See, in the constitutional setup, the Vice President is part of the Union Executive. But as the chairman of the Rajya Sabha, the Vice President of India also forms part of the Parliament. So we can say that the Vice President of India has a dual capacity and holds two distinct and separate offices. So option A is correct. Option B says that the Vice President of India is not bound to give reasons for his or her decisions while functioning as the chairman of Rajya Sabha. This option is also correct. See. As the chairman of Rajya Sabha, the vice president performs various functions. The functions are presiding over the meetings of Rajya Sabha, then acting as the principal spokesman of the house, then ensuring that the proceedings of the house are conducted in accordance with the relevant constitutional provisions, rules, practices and conventions. Then he also ensures that the decorum is maintained in the house and so on. See, during the exercise of his functions, the chairman may take some decisions or he may give some rulings. The rulings of the chairman are of binding nature and he is not bound to give reasons for his decisions. Also know that the chairman's rulings cannot be questioned or criticized. And note that the act of protest against the ruling of the chairman is regarded as a contempt of the house. From this information, we can say that option B is correct. Now look at option C. It says that the chairman of Rajya Sabha is not entitled to vote in the Rajya Sabha under any circumstance. This option is incorrect. See, the vice president while acting as the chairman of the Rajya Sabha shall not be entitled to vote in the first instance. But when there is a tie, the chairman gets the power of voting and this is in accordance with Article 100 of the Indian Constitution and this voting is called a casting vote. So the option C is incorrect. The vice president is entitled to vote when there is a tie in the Rajya Sabha. So now itself we have arrived at the answer but we have to verify whether option D is correct or not. See option D says that the process of removal of the Vice President of India can be initiated in the Rajya Sabha only. This option is correct. The process of removal of Vice President of India can be initiated only in the Rajya Sabha. The Rajya Sabha has the power to investigate the charges against the Vice President. So after investigation, if the Vice President is found guilty, the removal motion has to be passed with the effective majority in the Rajya Sabha. 
after that it would be sent to the lok sabha and the lok sabha has to pass the removal motion with the simple majority if the lok sabha passes the removal motion the vice president of india stands removed from his office see the lok sabha is having some powers in the removal of vice president but the process has to be initiated only in the rajya sabha so here option d is correct now let us move on to the next question see this question is about the members of sarc see in upsc many times questions about members of international organizations were asked the recent example is the 2020 prelims in 2020 prelims membership of g20 was asked now i have framed this question about sarc this is because 8th december 2022 marked the 38th sarc charter day since it was in news upsc might ask questions about sarc now let's solve this question but before that we will see few facts about sarc see sarc stands for south asian association for regional cooperation sarc as a regional organization came into existence in the year 1985 it was established after the signing of sarc charter by the member countries in dhaka bangladesh in 1985 The secretariat of the association is located at Kathmandu, Nepal. The objectives of SARC include promoting the welfare of peoples of South Asia and improving their quality of life. Then, accelerating economic growth, social progress and cultural development in the region. Also, providing opportunity to all individuals to live their lives with dignity and to realize their full potential. Then, SARC also aims at contributing to mutual trust understanding and appreciation of one another's problem finally promoting active collaboration and mutual assistance in economic social cultural technical and scientific fields so these are some of the objectives of sarc now we will take up the question see members of sarc are Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka and Maldives. So, Myanmar is not a member and Thailand is also not a member. So, if we eliminate 1 and 5, we get the option B, 2, 3, 4 and 6 only. Among the members, Afghanistan is the newest member of SARC which was added at the 13th annual summit in 2005. So, with this information, Now we will move on to the next question. Look at this question here. This is a three statement question about purchasing managers index. We have to find the correct statement. Let's take the statement number 1. See, this statement says that the purchasing managers index is published monthly by the US based private company named S&P Global. This statement is correct. Purchasing Manager Index is compiled and published globally by a US based private company called S&P Global. Know that PMI is produced for more than 40 economies worldwide and the index is released every month. So statement 1 is correct. Statement 2 says that it provides information about the business conditions and health of the global economy. This statement is also correct. PMI is a survey based economic indicator. It is designed to provide a timely insight into the business conditions and health of the global economy. See, PMI is widely used to anticipate changing economic trends in official data such as GDP. It is also used as an alternative to know about economic performance and business conditions. Thus, PMI data are used by financial and corporate professionals to better understand where economies and markets are headed and it helps them to uncover opportunities. Therefore, statement 2 is also correct. Now, statement 3 says that PMI provides data about manufacturing sector only and it does not include the service sector. See, initially PMI was compiled for the manufacturing sector only but later it was extended to include other sectors such as services construction and retail so this statement is incorrect 
द सर्विस पी एम आई वॉज इंट्रोड्यूस्ड इन नाइनटीन नाइन्टी सिक्स इट वॉज इंट्रोड्यूस्ड टू अकम्पनी द एक्सिस्टिंग मैनुफैक्चरिंग पी एम आई दिस इज बिकॉज द बिजनेस एनालिस्ट वॉन्टेड अ बेटर अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ द चेंजिंग बिजनेस कंडीशन इन द वाइडर एक्नॉमी सो बेसिकली द सर्विस सेक्टर्स कवर्ड अंडर पी एम आई इंक्लूड कंज्यूमर ट्रांसपोर्ट इंफॉर्मेशन कम्युनिकेशन फिनांस इंश्योरेंस real estate and business services from this information we can say that the third statement is incorrect this is because pmi provides data about both manufacturing and service sector so the answer for this question is option a 1 and 2 only now we will take up the next question now this question here is about ramjet and scramjet engines i have framed this question because in december isro has conducted the hot test of scramjet engine also upsc has already asked questions about the latest happenings in isro this question in 2018 prelims is an example for this it is about pslv and gslv so there is a possibility of upsc asking question about ramjet and scramjet engines also now let's solve this question first statement says that unlike ramjet engines scramjet engines do not rely on the aircraft's forward motion to compress the incoming air see this statement is incorrect because ramjet is a type of air breathing jet engine that relies on aircraft's forward motion to compress the incoming air for the combustion purpose likewise scramjet engine also relies on the aircraft's forward motion to compress the incoming air for the combustion process so which means both the engines do not have rotating compressor then second statement says that both ramjet and scramjet engines have the capacity of operating at hypersonic speeds see this statement is also incorrect because the average speed of ramjet is 3 to 6 mach see the efficiency of the ramjet engine starts to drop when the vehicle reaches hypersonic speeds that is typically 6 mach for this reason only scramjet engine was developed see the scramjet engine is an improvement over the ramjet engine it efficiently operates at hypersonic speeds it even allows supersonic combustion meaning speed more than 6 mach so both engines do not operate at hypersonic speeds mainly remember scramjets have supersonic air flow in their combustion chambers whereas ramjets have subsonic air flow one of their primary advantages is that scramjet and ramjet engines have no rotating or moving parts so the correct answer for this question is option d neither one nor two now we will take up the next question see this question talks about asteroids and meteoroids first let's discuss about these terms and then we will solve this question let's begin with asteroids see asteroids are small rocky bodies that orbit the sun while they are smaller than planets they are larger than meteoroids most asteroids reside in the main asteroid belt between mars and jupiter although some can be found in other locations throughout the solar system some asteroids may even orbit the sun in a path that takes them close to earth then when asteroids collide and break apart it results in small pieces that are called meteoroids see these meteoroids can also originate from comets meteors occur when meteoroids come close enough to earth and enter the atmosphere creating a streak of light in the sky that is commonly referred to as the shooting star meteor showers occur when earth passes through the debris trail left by a comet resulting in a higher frequency of meteors in the sky so know that a meteors can be a small piece of asteroid or a comet now coming to comets they are made of ice and dust and orbit the sun like asteroids as the comets orbit takes it closer to the sun 
the eyes and dust vaporize resulting in a visible tail finally meteorites are meteoroids that survive their trip through earth's atmosphere and land on the planet surface now read the question here statement 1 is correct asteroids are made of rocks and metal while comets are made of ice and dust here statement 2 is also correct meteoroids can come from both asteroids and comets so the correct answer for this question is option c both 1 and 2 now let's move on to the next question see this question talks about the famous kohinoor diamond so first let's see about kohinoor diamond and then we will get back to this question here kohinoor means mountain of light this priceless diamond now forms part of the british crown jewels displayed in the tower of london see the kohinoor is a large colorless diamond that was found close to guntur in the 13th century it weighed 793 carats uncut and it was initially owned by the kakatiya dynasty yes the kakatiya kings with their capital at varangal ruled over most parts of andhra during 1083 to 1323 ad in the early 14th century alauddin khilji second ruler of the khilji dynasty of the delhi sultanate and his army began to rob the kingdoms of southern india malik kafur who was khilji's general created a victorious raid on varangal in 1310 when he probably acquired the diamond so this diamond remained within the khilji family line and it was later passed to the succeeding dynasties of the delhi sultanate and later it came into the possession of babur in the 16th century ad then in the 17th century shah jahan who is the fifth mughal ruler had the stone placed in his ornate peacock throne in the 17th century following the 1739 invasion of delhi by nadir shah the treasury of the mughal empire was plundered besides a bunch of valuable things together with daryai noor as well as the peacock throne and the kohinoor diamond was also carried away in the 18th century after the assassination of nadir shah in 1747 and also the collapse of his empire the stone came into the hands of one of his generals ahmed shah durani who later became the amir of islamic state of afghanistan In the 19th century after Ahmed Shah the diamond came into possession of Ahmed Shah Durrani's descendant Sauja Shah Durrani so he brought the Kohinoor back to India in 1813 and gave it to Ranjit Singh who was the founding father of the Sikh empire in exchange Ranjit Singh helped Shah Suja retreat to the throne of Islamic state of Afghanistan On 29 March 1849 following the conclusion of the Second Anglo-Sikh War the dominion of Punjab was formally annexed to British India and also the last treaty of Lahore was signed the Kohinoor was given to the empress and the maharaja's other assets were formally given to the company so now coming back to the question here statement number 1 that is Kakatiya dynasty was the first owner of Kohinoor diamond this statement is correct we saw this in the discussion itself and here statement number 2 is incorrect we saw that the diamond is a colorless one and it is not pale pink in color and finally statement number 3 is also incorrect the Kohinoor diamond is not the largest in the world it is actually not even in the top 50 list of the largest diamonds so this statement is also incorrect here answer is option a one only now we will move on to the next question see here a syndrome is described it says that it is a genetic disorder that results in developmental delays it is also known as trisomy 21 it occurs when a person has an extra copy of chromosome 21 individuals with this syndrome may have difficulty with speech and language as well as fine motor skills which of the following best matches the description given here 
the answer is option d down syndrome so now we will see in brief about down syndrome see down syndrome is a chromosomal disorder in which a person is born with an extra chromosome as we all know the chromosomes are small packages of genes present in the cells of our body see these chromosomes only shape and function a baby's body usually a baby is born with 46 chromosomes in which 23 are inherited from the mother and 23 from the father but know that a person with down syndrome may contain 47 chromosome as there is an extra copy of chromosome 21 so this additional genetic material causes physical and developmental characteristics associated with down syndrome so this is in brief about down syndrome now talking about its types there are basically three types of down syndrome firstly trisomy 21 see it is the most common type and it affects approximately 95% of people with down syndrome in this type of down syndrome each cell in the body has three copies of chromosome 21 instead of the usual two copies of chromosome 21 then the second type is translocation down syndrome it is caused when a part or a whole extra chromosome 21 is attached or translocated to another chromosome know that here the chromosome 21 is attached to another chromosome rather than being a separate chromosome and finally mosaic down syndrome see it is the least common type here only some of the cells have an extra copy of chromosome 21 and not every cells and know that the effects of each of these types are usually similar now talking about the symptoms babies with down syndrome have specific traits and development issues there are a few abnormalities and the most common one is that the person is having abnormal facial features which is popularly known as dysmorphic features then the down syndrome patients usually have upslanted eyes that is the eyes are slanted upwards then they also have flat nose then unusually formed ears and short height neck and hands then the muscle tone of down syndrome patients is weak which results in sitting difficulties then the iq of down syndrome patients is borderline which is between 50 to 70 know that normal babies have an iq of about 75 to 80 also know that about 40 to 45% down syndrome patients have congenital heart disease and they also face eyesight problems and hearing losses with this information now we will move on to the next question look at this question here which of the following articles of the indian constitution guarantees the right to freedom of conscience profess practice and propagation of religion the correct answer is option b article 25 now let us learn some points about article 25 first of all know that article 25 falls under the fundamental rights of right to freedom of religion there are basically four articles that comes under the right to freedom of religion they are article 25 26 27 and 28 now we will learn about article 25 see article 25 guarantees the right to freedom of conscience profession practice and propagation of religion to put it simply article 25 guarantees people's right to believe in a religion right to express the religious belief right to take part in religious rituals and ceremonies and finally to propagate the religion of their choice an important thing that you have to remember is that the right provided under article 25 is available to both citizens and non citizens and know that the freedom guaranteed under article 25 has some restrictions the first major restriction is that 
while people practice their freedom of religion under article 25 they must not violate public order morality health and other provisions relating to fundamental rights this restriction is placed because without this restriction people will practice social evils like sati untouchability which also come under the aspect of freedom of religion so while practicing the right to freedom of religion people should not violate public order morality and health and other provisions relating to fundamental rights and the second restriction is that the state can make laws to regulate any economic financial political or other secular activity associated with religious practice this allows the state to interfere in some of the activities of religious practice so this is all about article 25 now we will move on to the next question look at this question here it is about the anti drone system in india see drones are gaining significance in recent days this is because of their applications drones have a wide variety of applications ranging from research agriculture to more complex spying operations see i have framed this particular question based on anti drone system because last year in december 16 drones were shot down along pakistan india border by the border security force so upsc might ask a question about this so we'll take up this question for discussion now here the first statement says that anti drone system in india is capable of deterring the small medium and large drones only this is incorrect because Indian anti-drone system can detect, identify and neutralize different types of drones including small hybrid UAVs, micro UAV, multi-rotor and nano UAVs. Second statement says that anti-drone system in India is capable of doing both soft kill and hard kill. See this statement is true actually. counter drone system can detect track and identify airborne drones using multiple sensors the system can also enable counter techniques to deny them the intended operation which is soft kill and destroy them that is hard kill so here soft kill refers to the jamming of communication channels and the electronic instruments of the drone whereas hard kill refers to the laser enabled counter measure which destroys the drone itself know that the detection of drone is done with the help of radars and rf based detection system the identification is done with the help of electro optic sensor and comment the soft kill is carried out with rf jamming and anti gnss technologies and hard kill with the help of laser directed energy weapon the correct answer for this question is option b two only apart from this also know that the drone detect deter and destroy system that is d4es is the first indigenously developed anti drone system to be inducted into the indian armed forces it is developed by drdo and manufactured by Bharat Electronics Limited. So, with this understanding, now we will take up the next question. See, this question reads: Which of the following agents is responsible for turning the Taj Mahal yellow? The correct answer for this question is option C: sulfur dioxide. Typically, sulfur dioxide is emitted when fuels or other materials containing sulfur are combusted or oxidized. So, it is a pollutant. that contributes to acid deposition which in turn can lead to changes in soil and water quality the subsequent impacts of acid deposition can be significant including adverse effects on aquatic systems in river and lakes and damage to forest crops and other vegetations Sulfur dioxide emissions also aggravate asthma conditions and can reduce lung function and inflame the respiratory tract. 
दे ऑल्सो कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट एस ए सेकेंडरी पार्टिकुलेट पोल्यूटेंट टू द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ पार्टिकुलेट मैटर इन द एटमोसफियर पार्टिकुलेट मैटर इज ऑल्सो एन इम्पॉर्टेंट एयर पोल्यूटेंट इन टर्म्स ऑफ इट्स एडवर्स इम्पैक्ट ऑन ह्यूमन हेल्थ फर्दर मोर द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ सल्फेट पार्टिकल्स इन द एटमोसफियर फॉलोइंग द रिलीज ऑफ सल्फेट डाइऑक्साइड रिजल्ट इन रिफ्लेक्शन ऑफ सोलर रेडिएशन which leads to net cooling of the atmosphere so the correct answer for this question is option c sulfur dioxide now we will take up the next question for a discussion see this question reads if i intend to access any biological resource in india for research or for commercial utilization i have to seek the prior approval of this body this body forms the first tier of a three tier structure and it has the same power as a vested in a civil court the monetary benefits arising as a result of approval of this body will be deposited in the national biodiversity fund which one of the following is that body see this question is a bit tricky here the question did not mention whether the person is an indian or a foreigner in such cases it can be both that is an indian or a foreigner here the correct answer for the question is option d nba that is national biodiversity authority now let us see few facts about nba see national biodiversity authority that is nba was established under india's biological diversity act of 2002 it was established by the central government in the year 2003 so nba is a statutory body see the main intent of this legislation is to protect india's rich biodiversity and associated knowledge against their use by foreign individuals and organizations without sharing the benefits arising out of such use and to check bio piracy to put it in simple words the legislation is an attempt to enforce access and benefit sharing abs mechanism as enshrined in the united nations convention on biological diversity 1992 to enable abs mechanism the act provides for setting up of a national biodiversity authority state biodiversity boards and biodiversity management committees in local bodies while nba and sbb are required to consult bmcs in decisions relating to use of biological resources within their jurisdiction bmcs promote conservation sustainable use and documentation of biodiversity at the local level remember all foreign nationals or organizations require prior approval of nba for obtaining biological resources and associated knowledge for any use indian individuals or entities need prior approval of sbas for such purposes in case indian individuals or entities wanted to transfer results of research with respect to any biological resources to foreign nationals or organizations then they need the approval of nba the monetary benefits fees royalties as a result of approvals by nba will be deposited in national biodiversity fund in case the fund has to be shared with a specific individual or group of individuals it will be shared directly to the local biodiversity funds maintained by the bmcs the respective individuals will be found using the people biodiversity register maintained by the bmcs people biodiversity register is a legal document that contains details of biological resources occurring within a bmc and contains associated knowledge as well the people biodiversity register acts as a source of inventory of biological resources and knowledge and for benefit sharing purposes under the abs component remember the nba will enjoy the power of a civil court any grievances related to the determination of benefit sharing or order of nba or sbb under the act shall be taken to the national green tribunal 
we already have a previous year question about NBA. You can have a look at it. That's all. Now we will move on to the next question discussion. See this question reads: Salal Haimana area recently seen in news is located in which of the following region? The correct answer for this question is option A on the banks of Chenab River around 90 km from the winter capital of Jammu. See, the Salal Haimana area is located in the Risi district of Jammu. Recently, it was in news because of the discovery of lithium inferred resources. Now, let us quickly revise some of the basic points about lithium ion batteries. See, lithium ion battery is an advanced battery technology that uses lithium ions as a key component of its electrochemistry. You can find these batteries in laptops, PDAs, cell phones and iPods. They are some of the most energetic rechargeable batteries available. Remember, the electrodes of a lithium ion battery are made of lightweight lithium and carbon. The most common combination is lithium cobalt oxide cathode and graphite as anode. Other cathode materials include lithium manganese oxide and lithium ion phosphate. See, lithium ion batteries typically use ether which is a class of organic compounds as an electrolyte. Know that both the anode and cathode store the lithium. The electrolyte carries positively charged lithium ions from the anode to the cathode and vice versa through the separator. The movement of the lithium ions creates free electrons in the anode which creates a charge at the positive current collector. The electrical current then flows from the current collector to the devices like cell phone, computer etc. Now with this information let us see some of the advantages of lithium ion batteries. Firstly they are generally much lighter than other types of rechargeable batteries of the same size. Secondly lithium ion batteries are capable of having a very high voltage and charge storage per unit mass and unit volume. A typical lithium ion battery can store 150 watt hours of electricity in just 1 kilogram of battery but a nickel metal hydrate battery can store only 60 to 70 watt hours in 1 kilogram of battery a lead acid battery can store only 25 watt hours per kilogram so what does this mean this means that it takes 6 kilograms of lead acid battery to store the same amount of energy that a 1 kilogram lithium ion battery can handle. And this is the reason why lithium ion batteries are famous. Thirdly, a lithium ion battery pack loses only about 5% of its charge per month. This is less when compared to a 20% loss per month for nickel metal hydrate batteries. Fourthly, they have no memory effect which means that you do not have to completely discharge them before recharging. Finally, lithium ion batteries can handle hundreds of charge or discharge cycles. Because of these advantages only, its discovery is most significant in India. With this understanding, now we will move on to the next question discussion. Look at this question here. This is a three statement question about the Wildlife Protection Amendment Act of 2022. From these statements, we have to find the correct statement. Now before answering the question, let us learn some important points about Wildlife Protection Amendment Act of 2022. See, in December 2021, the Union Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change introduced the Wildlife Amendment Bill 2021 in the Lok Sabha. This bill sought to amend the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. So this bill was passed by both the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha in August 2022 and December 2022 respectively. Finally, the Wildlife Protection Amendment Bill 2021 received the assent of the President on 19th December 2022. So, the bill became an act and 
it came to be known as the wildlife protection amendment act of 2022 now let us see the key features of wildlife amendment act of 2022 Firstly the 2022 amendment act inserted a new schedule for specimens listed in the appendices under sites see the sites is expanded as convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora know that sites is a global agreement among governments to regulate or ban international trade in species that are under threat under sites plant and animal specimens are classified into basically three categories that is into three appendices which is based on the level of threats they face see the sites requires the member countries to regulate the trade of all listed specimens through permits and it also seeks to regulate the possession of live animal specimens know that india is a signatory to the sites so in order to implement the obligations of the sites india inserted a new schedule for specimens listed in the appendices under sites then the second important feature is that the 2022 amendment act rationalized the schedules of the wildlife protection act earlier we know that there were six schedules that is one was specifically for protected plants then four for specially protected animals and one for the vermin species now the 2022 amendment act has reduced the total number of schedules from 6 to 4 it reduced the number of schedules for specially protected animals from 4 to 2 then the amendment act had removed the schedule for vermin species and the act inserted a new schedule for specimens listed in the appendix under sites so as of now there are only four schedules in the wildlife protection act 1972 then the third feature of the 2022 amendment act is that it empowers the central government to regulate or prohibit the import trade possession or proliferation of invasive alien species so now the central government may authorize an officer to seize and dispose of the invasive species then the fourth important feature is that the 2022 amendment act entrusts the chief wildlife warden of the state to control manage and maintain all sanctuaries in a state the act specifies that the action of the chief warden must be in accordance with the management plans for the sanctuary and these plans will be prepared as per the guidelines of the central government then the fifth important feature is that the amendment act empowers the central government to notify the areas as a conservation reserve earlier the power to notify a particular area as a conservation reserve was totally vested with the state government but now the central government may also notify a conservation reserve know that the conservation reserves are basically the areas that are adjacent to national parks and sanctuaries and finally the amendment act increased the fine amount for violation of the provisions of the act see i have discussed only some important provisions kindly go through the other provisions of the wildlife amendment act 2022 it would be very helpful for both your prelims and mains now let's take the question here statement 1 says that the act inserted a new schedule in the wildlife act 1972 for specimens listed in the appendix under sites the statement is true as we saw in the discussion and here statement 2 says that it empowers the central government to notify a particular area as a conservation reserve we know that earlier only state governments were authorized to do this but now this amendment empowers the central government also to notify a particular area as a conservation reserve so this statement is also correct third statement tells that This act entrusts the chief wildlife warden of a state to control, manage, and maintain all sanctuaries in a state. This statement is also correct. So the correct answer here is option D, one, two, and three. Now we will take up the next question. Look at this question here. It reads: 
he was an indian philosopher and nationalist he was born on 15th august 1872 in kolkata he went to england for pursuing higher studies he functioned as a editor of the english daily bande madram he was arrested under charges of involvement in alipur bomb case who among the following is such a person the correct answer for this question is option b shri aurobindo ghosh now let us learn some points about aurobindo shri aurobindo ghosh was born on 15th of august 1872 in calcutta he was an indian philosopher poet and nationalist in 1879 Aurobindo along with his brothers were sent to England for higher studies and Aurobindo completed his schooling from the St Paul's in London then in the year 1890 Aurobindo got admission into the University of Cambridge see to comply with the wish of his father Aurobindo applied for the ICS while at Cambridge and so he passed the Indian Civil Service examination in 1890 However, he failed in the horsemanship test and he was not allowed to enter the civil service of the Indian government. Then in 1893, Aurobindo goes returned to India. After returning to India, he became the vice principal of the state college in Baroda. Then in 1906, Aurobindo resigned his job in the wake of partition of Bengal and he joined as professor in the Bengal National College. From there he involved in the revolutionary movement against the British. Then from 1908 Aurobindo Ghosh played a leading role in India's freedom struggle. He was one of the pioneers of political awakening in India. Also know that Aurobindo functioned as the editor of the English daily Bande Madram. In that he openly advocated the boycott of British goods and British codes. He also asked the people to prepare themselves for passive resistance against the British. Now we will see about the famous Alipur bomb case that is related to Aurobindo's life. See in 1908 the British judge Kingsford had imposed severe sentences against the Indian nationalists. This made the Indian revolutionaries angry. Some revolutionaries including Kudiram Bose and Prafulla Chakki tried to kill the judge. They threw bombs at Judge Kingsford's horse carriage but the bomb lost its target and instead landed in another carriage and that bomb blast killed two British women. See in that case Aurobindo was also arrested on the charges of plotting and overseeing the attack. Then he was jailed in Alipur jail. See the trial of the Alipur bomb case lasted for a year and Aurobindo was eventually acquitted on 6th May 1909 know that the defense counsel of Aurobindo was Chitraranjan Das during the jail term Aurobindo's path of life was radically modified he was influenced by spiritual experiences and realizations then Aurobindo's aim went so far and he devoted himself for service and liberation of the country so with these points in mind now we will move on to the next question see this question here is about sixth schedule i have framed this question because after the bifurcation of jammu and kashmir political groups in ladakh are demanding to include ladakh in the sixth schedule so this aspect is very important for the upsc examination now here the first statement of the question says sixth schedule pertains to the administration of tribal areas in the states of assam meghalaya tripura only this statement is incorrect because the sixth schedule consists of provisions related to the administration of tribal areas in the states of assam meghalaya tripura and mizoram so in this particular statement mizoram is missing that's why it is incorrect also know that provisions related to the sixth schedule are provided under articles 2442 and 2751 of the indian constitution here the second statement says that autonomous district councils formed for the administration of the tribal areas consists of both nominated and elected members this is correct see 
The sixth schedule provides for the administration of certain tribal areas in the four states as autonomous districts and autonomous regions. Governors of the state is empowered to determine the area or areas as administrative units of the autonomous districts and autonomous regions. Under the sixth schedule, governor has the power to create a new autonomous district or region. Then the governor also has the power to alter the territorial jurisdiction or even to alter the name of any autonomous district or autonomous region. And the sixth schedule also has the provisions for the creation of autonomous district councils and regional councils. Know that councils are endowed with certain legislative, executive, judicial and even financial powers. According to sixth schedule, each autonomous district shall have a district council and the council shall consist of not more than 30 members. Know that among 30 members, four are nominated by the governor while the rest are elected on the basis of adult franchise. Note one point here, there is one exception that is Bodo Land Territorial Council in Assam can have up to 46 members in the council. So the correct answer for this question is option B, two only. Now we will move on to the next question. See this question is about Great Indian Hornbills. Four statements are given and we have to find the incorrect statements here. Statement one is correct. The Great Indian Hornbills are indeed called the farmers of the forest. But why are they called farmers of forest? Hornbills are large frugivore birds. Here, frugivore means a species that feeds mainly on fruits. Being a frugivore, the great Indian hornbills are efficient seed dispersers. This is because they cover a large area in a day. After feeding, hornbills usually regurgate or excrete the seeds. The hornbills home range usually extends to at least 10 km which means that it can be much more efficient than other small frugivores in dispersing seeds at a wider range of territory. The presence of hornbills indicates that the forest is not only prosperous but also balanced. So this is why hornbills are considered as indicator species. The bird plays a vital role in maintaining the health of forests. Now moving on to statement 2. It says that only the male great Indian hornbills have casks or horns. See this statement is incorrect. Both male and female hornbills have casks or horns. The cask is hollow and serves no known purpose. Although it is thought to be the result of sexual selection. Male hornbills indulge in aerial cask butting which is nothing but birds striking each other in flight. Now look at statement 3. Great Indian hornbill is the only species of hornbill that is found in India and it is the largest hornbill species in the world. This statement is incorrect. India has 9 of the 54 species of hornbill that are found in the world. Also, the great Indian hornbill is the largest hornbill species in India but not in the world. The largest hornbill species in the world is the southern ground hornbill. The last statement reads that it is the state bird of Nagaland and Kerala. This statement is incorrect. Great Indian hornbill is the state bird of Arunachal Pradesh and Kerala. The state bird of Nagaland is Blitz Trakovan. Since the question is asking for incorrect statements here, the correct option is option B, 2, 3 and 4 only. Before concluding this discussion, let us see a few facts about Great Indian Hornbill. See, as I already told, the Great Indian Hornbill is the largest hornbill species found in the Indian subcontinent. The bright yellow horn on its top is called cask, which is a unique morphological feature of Great Indian Hornbill. The beak is curved downwards and besides eating, it also helps while climbing the tree. The beak and feathers on the neck, breast, wings and tail appears yellow. They have a wingspan of 5 feet. Now, moving on to its habitat. 
मेचर ब्रॉड लीव फॉरेस्ट विद फ्रूटिंग ट्रीज इज द मेजर हैबिटेट ऑफ ग्रेट हॉर्नबिल इट मेनली फेवर्स अनलॉक्ड ओल्ड ग्रोथ फॉरेस्ट विथ लार्ज ट्रीज इट अकर्स फ्रॉम एन एलिवेशन ऑफ हंड्रेड टू फाइव हंड्रेड मीटर अबाउ सी लेवल नाउ मूविंग ऑन टू इट्स फीडिंग बिहेवियर दे फीड ऑन ह्यूज वेराइटीज ऑफ फ्रूट्स बेरीज एंड फिक्स इट फ्लाइज ग्रेट डिस्टेंसेज एंड डिस्पर्स द सीड्स थ्रू पेलेट्स विच हेल्प टू रीजनरेट द फॉरेस्ट इट मेंटेन्स अ हेल्दी इको सिस्टम बाय कंज्यूमिंग लार्ज नंबर ऑफ टेस्ट इंसेक्ट्स एंड स्मॉल एनिमल्स लाइक लिजर्ड्स रैट्स एंड शरूस This is also one of the reason as to why they are called the farmer of the forest. Now take a note of its conservation status. It is listed in Sites Appendix One. It has been listed as vulnerable on the IUCN Red List. So these are some of the points that you have to know about the Great Indian Hornbill. Now we will take up the next question for a discussion. See, this question is about the Sarkaria Commission. Four statements are given, and we have to find which of the following are the suggestions or recommendations made by the commission. See, the office of governor has always been a controversial post in Indian federal setup. The Sarkaria Commission made some recommendations that could be adopted during the appointment of governor to prevent the frequent flare-ups between the union and state government. The commission recommended that the governor should be eminent in some walks of life and from outside the state. He should be a detached figure without intense political links or should not have taken part in politics in the recent past. Besides, he should not be a member of the ruling party. So the statements 1, 2 and 3 given here are correct. What about the last statement? It was the Punshi Commission that gave this recommendation. The Punshi Commission suggested the formation of a committee consisting of Prime Minister, the Home Minister, the Lok Sabha Speaker, and the concerned Chief Minister of the state. And this committee must make the appointment of Governor. Since only one, two, and three are correct, the correct answer here is option A. Now, as a part of this discussion, let us see some recommendations made by Sarkaria Commission regarding the removal of governor. Firstly, the commission stated that, as far as possible, the governor should enjoy the term of five years. Secondly, the governor should be removed before his tenure only on grounds as mentioned in the constitution. Very rarely, when there are apprehensions about the governor's morality and dignity, he can be removed. Lastly, when the governor is to be removed, the state government may be informed and consulted. So these are some recommendations of the Sarkaria Commission regarding the removal of the governor. Now, with these points in mind, now we will move on to the next question. See, this question here is about GI tag. We all know GI tags will be given to products. Recently, also in newspaper, there was an article about products that were given GI tags, and some other products which were seeking GI tags. So this year, you might expect a question regarding GI tag. Based on this only, I have framed this question. Here, the first statement says that geographical indication tag is a form of intellectual property. This is true. This is the reason why geographical indications are covered as an element of intellectual property rights under the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property. They are also covered under TRIPS Agreement, that is, trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. This was part of the agreements concluding the Uruguay Round of GATT negotiations, that is, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. thus geographical indications of goods are defined as that aspect of industrial property second statement says that geographical indication tag is given for both indian and foreign products this is also true we know gi tags are given for indian products but know that foreign products can also be given gi tag in india already many foreign products were granted gi tags Some of the examples include Brandy de Jerez of Spain, Munchener and Bayerisches Bier of Germany, Irish ice cream or Irish cream liqueur of Ireland, Provolone Valpadana of Italy, and so on. 
third statement says that in India GA tag was first given to Kashmiri Pashmina. See this statement is incorrect actually. The first product to get GA tag was West Bengal's Darjeeling tea. Just go through some of the products that have GA tags particularly the recent ones. It will be useful for your prelims. So the correct answer for this question is option A 1 and 2 only. Now we will take up the next question. Look at this question. It is a three statement question about the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers act 2006. Here we have to find the incorrect statements. First of all know that the scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers act of 2006 is commonly called as forest rights act of 2006. This act recognizes the rights of the forest dwelling tribal communities and other traditional forest dwellers by ensuring their rights on forest resources. See, the forest dwelling communities are dependent on forest resources for a variety of their needs like livelihood, habitation and other socio-cultural needs. So, in order to address their needs, the Forest Rights Act of 2006 allows the ownership of minor forests produced to the forest dwellers. Apart from this, the FRA also recognizes the symbiotic relationship of the scheduled tribes with the forest. This means that the act recognizes the traditional practice of forest dwellers regarding the conservation of forests. Note one important fact here. The Ministry of Tribal Affairs is the nodal agency at the national level to ensure effective implementation of the SDs and other traditional forest dwellers act 2006. Now what are all the rights encompassed by this act? Firstly this act provides individual rights such as self-cultivation and habitation. Secondly, the act encompasses the community rights such as grazing, fishing and access to water bodies in forest. Apart from this, the act also provides the habitat rights for PVTGs. Thirdly, the act ensures the community's rights to intellectual property and traditional knowledge. And most importantly, the act also recognizes the traditional customary rights. And finally, the act provides more power to the Gram Sabhas. See, the responsibility of conservation and protection of biodiversity, wildlife, forests, adjoining catchment areas, water resources and other ecologically sensitive areas are vested with Gram Sabhas. Apart from this, the FRA 2006 also provides Gram Sabha a responsibility to stop any destructive practices affecting these resources or cultural and natural heritage of the tribals. And know that the Gram Sabha is also vested with the authority to initiate the process for determining the nature and extent of individual or community forest rights. So we can say that the Gram Sabha is a highly empowered body under FRA. With this information, now let's approach the question. Statement 1 says, the act allows for the ownership of minor forests produced to the forest dwellers. This statement is correct. We saw this in the discussion. The second statement says that the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change is the nodal agency at the national level to ensure effective implementation of the act. This statement is actually incorrect. We saw in the discussion that it is Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Here statement 3 says that this act does not recognize the traditional customary rights of the forest dwelling communities. This statement is incorrect. The FRA 2006 recognizes the traditional customary rights. Here the question asks for incorrect statement. So the correct answer is option B 2 and 3 only. Now let's take up the next question for a discussion. See this question is about anemia. Four statements are given. We have to find which of the statements are correct. Before we approach the question, let us first see some points about anemia. Firstly, what is anemia? 
Anemia can be defined as a condition where the number of RBCs and consequently their oxygen carrying capacity is insufficient to meet the body's physiological needs. Now, why do RBCs decrease or what causes anemia? The answer to both is the same. There are so many reasons for this and they can be categorized as nutritional and non-nutritional causes. First, let's see the nutritional causes for anemia. The first and major one is iron deficiency. See, among all causes, it is the most important cause. Iron is necessary for synthesis of hemoglobin. So, when the iron is deficient, hemoglobin does not synthesize thereby impairing its function. Iron deficiency is the most important cause of anemia worldwide. So, it is even referred to as iron deficiency anemia. Also note that the other nutritional deficiencies can also cause anemia. This includes deficiency in vitamins such as vitamin B9, vitamin B12 and vitamin A. Vitamin B9 is also known by the name folate. Now we will see about the non-nutritional causes of anemia. This includes defective red cell production. For example, aplastic anemia is a condition which can prevent the body from making enough red blood cells. Second is increased red cell destruction. For example, enlarged or diseased spleen can cause increased red cell destruction. Then increased blood loss is also a reason. Also, acute and chronic inflammation and parasitic infections also cause anemia and sometimes inherited or acute disorders that affect hemoglobin synthesis, RBC production or survival can also cause anemia. This include disorders like sickle cell disease and thalassemia. So these are some of the causes of anemia. Now we will see what will happen if someone gets anemia. See if a child has Iron deficiency anemia, it results in impaired cognitive and motor development. And in adults, the same causes decreased work capacity. Anemia might also lead to impaired sexual and reproductive development like perinatal loss, prematurity and low birth weight babies. Prematurity means a premature birth of baby where birth takes place more than three weeks before the estimated due date. Generally, iron deficiency anemia also adversely affects the body's immune response. Some of the programs launched by our government to counter the prevalence of anemia in our country are Anemia Mukt Bharat, National Iron Plus Initiative, Scheme for Adolescent Girls and Weekly Iron and Folic Acid Supplementation Program for Adolescent Girls and Boys. These are some points about anemia that you have to know in the prelims perspective. Now coming to the question, here statement 1 says that deficiency of iron or vitamin B9 might lead to anemia. This statement is correct. This we saw in the discussion itself. Along with deficiency of iron and vitamin B9, deficiency in vitamin A and B12 might also lead to anemia. Statement 2 says that inherited diseases like sickle cell and thalassemia might lead to anemia. This statement is also correct. Sickle cell and thalassemia will lead to anemia. Statement 3 says that between NFHS4 and NFHS5, the prevalence of anemia among women declined while for men it increased. This statement is incorrect. Between NFHS4 and NFHS5, the prevalence of anemia increased in both men and women in India. Statement 4 says that according to NFHS5, the states with the lowest prevalence of anemia among children were Kerala, Nagaland and Manipur. This statement is correct. The three states with the lowest prevalence of anemia in India are Kerala, Nagaland and Manipur. So the correct answer here is option C. 1, 2 and 4 only. Now we will move on to the next question. See this question talks about the types of coal. First we will see some information about coal and then we will get back to this question. See coal forms through a process called carbonization. So what is carbonization? The process of conversion of 
decomposed carbon based deposits of plant material into coal due to tremendous heat and pressure deep below the surface of earth is called carbonization remember the quality of coal depends upon its carbon content the carbon content in turn depends upon how long the particular material has undergone carbonization so basically the older the coal the higher the carbon content in it and higher will be the quality of coal now let us see the types of coal see coal is classified based on the amount of carbon content in it first one is anthracite coal it is the best quality coal with carbon content up to 80 to 95% they are also called carboniferous coal as this coal was formed during the carboniferous period the carboniferous period occurred some 300 to 350 million years ago in india we have only very limited anthracite coal deposits it is mainly found in the jammu and kashmir region moving on we'll see about the bituminous coal see the carbon content in this coal varies from 40 to 80% it is also called gondwana coal as this coal formed mainly during the gondwana period the gondwana period occurred some 250 million years ago so bituminous is younger than the anthracite which is the reason for its lower quality about 80 percentage of the coal deposits in india is of bituminous type and is of non coking grade the first commercial coal mine in india was raniganj in west bengal the major coal producing states in india are jharkhand odisha west bengal madhya pradesh andhra pradesh and maharashtra important coal fields that produce gondwana or the bituminous coal includes jharia bokaro girdi and karanpura in jharkhand talcher and rampur coal fields in odisha chingrauli coal field in madhya pradesh singareni and kothagudam coal fields in andhra pradesh and kamti coal fields in maharashtra this is about the second type of coal that is bituminous coal now we'll see about the third type which is lignite this is also called tertiary coal as this coal belongs to the tertiary period the tertiary period occurred some 50 million years ago so lignite is the youngest coal the carbon content in this coal is very low and the moisture content is very high lignite is also called brown coal due to its color in india tertiary coal is found mainly in assam arunachal pradesh meghalaya and nagaland it is extracted from darangiri cherapunji melong and langrin which is located in meghalaya in assam it is mined in makum jaipur and nazira in arunachal pradesh it is found in namchik nambuk in jammu and kashmir it is found in kalakot in tamil nadu it is found in neiveli it is also found in pondicherry and gujarat the last one is peat coal it is lowest grade coal it has a lot of moisture and impurities so when we burn peat it leaves a lot of ash behind in india peat is found in nilgiris hills and the jhelum valley in jammu and kashmir so this is all regarding the types of coal and its distribution in india now we will see the question the correct answer here is option b peat lignite bituminous and anthracite this is because the question asks for increasing order of carbon content so now we will take up the next question for a discussion this question talks about asean first we will revise few points about asean and then we will get back to the question see the association of southeast asian nations which is shortly known as asean is a regional intergovernmental organization it was established on 8th august 1967 in bangkok thailand see the asean was established with the signing of the asean declaration which is popularly known as the bangkok declaration know that the secretariat of the asean is situated in jakarta indonesia now talking about its member the founding members of asean include indonesia malaysia philippines singapore and thailand and later brunei vietnam laos myanmar and cambodia were joined as full time members therefore at present there are totally 
10 full time members in the ASEAN. Again, note here that India is not a member of ASEAN, but it is a dialogue partner of the ASEAN. Now, talking about the chairmanship of ASEAN, the chairmanship of the ASEAN rotates annually according to the alphabetical order of the English names of the member countries. And know that Cambodia currently holds the ASEAN chairmanship that is for 2022. Now, talking about the ASEAN summit, the summit is held twice annually. Know that ASEAN summit is the highest policy making body in ASEAN and it comprises the head of states or government of the member states. Remember, the summit is hosted by the member state holding the ASEAN chairmanship. This is about ASEAN. Now let's see some important aims and purposes of ASEAN one by one. Firstly, the main purpose of ASEAN is to promote economic and security cooperation among its members. Secondly, it aims to promote regional peace and stability through abiding respect for justice and rule of law. Then thirdly, ASEAN aims to accelerate the economic growth, social progress and cultural development in the Southeast Asian region. And this is done through joint endeavors in the spirit of equality and partnership. Then fourthly, it aims to promote active collaboration and mutual assistance on matters of common interest in the economic, social, cultural, technical, scientific and administrative fields. And finally, it aims to provide assistance to each other in the form of training and research facilities in the educational, professional, technical and administrative spheres. We already have a previous year prelims question on ASEAN. You can have a look at it. Now we'll take up the question. The correct answer for the question is option C. Even though India began formal engagement with ASEAN in 1992 as a sectoral dialogue partner, it subsequently became a dialogue partner in 1996. So option C is incorrect. Now we will take up the next question for a discussion. See, this question is about Artemis 1. But before answering this question, let us quickly go through some important facts about Artemis 1. See, Artemis 1 is a mission of NASA. It is the first mission in a series of increasingly complex missions that will enable human exploration to the moon and Mars. Artemis 1 basically aims to build a long-term human presence on the moon. But how it will be possible? How can long-term human presence be ensured? It can be done by demonstrating the systems that will be involved in the mission. This is what is done by Artemis 1. It will be an uncrewed flight test that will provide a foundation for a human deep space exploration. It is carrying several payloads in the form of small satellites called CubeSats, each of which is equipped with instruments meant for specific investigations and experiments. One of these CubeSats will search for water in all its forms. NASA hopes to establish a base on the moon and to send astronauts to Mars by the late 2030s or early 2040s. So Artemis 1 will be the first integrated test of NASA's deep space exploration systems. The deep space exploration systems include firstly the Orion spacecraft which is a next generation spacecraft designed for the demands of human missions to deep space. Second is the space launch system SLS rocket which is termed the most powerful rocket in the world that is designed to send humans to deep space. And finally the ground systems at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Artemis 1 will be demonstrating all these capabilities prior to the first flight with the crew on Artemis 2. Under this, its primary goal was to demonstrate Orion's system in a space flight environment. So, Orion was to stay in space longer than any ship for astronauts has done without docking to a space station and then return home faster than ever before. So through this, it was to ensure a safe re-entry, descent, splashdown and recovery of the spacecraft. Here splashdown means touchdown 
of a returning spacecraft on the sea with the assistance of parachutes recently orion has safely splashed down that is why it was in news it has traveled more than 1.4 million miles on a path around the moon and has returned safely to earth after this successful mission in the future the second flight will take a crew on a different trajectory and test orion's critical systems with humans aboard so now let's take up the question it reads that Artemis 1 is the first in a series of increasingly complex mission that will enable human exploration to the moon and mars statement 2 says that it is carrying several payloads in the form of small satellites called cubesats here both the statements are correct the correct answer for the question is option c both 1 and 2 now let's take up the next question for a discussion See this is a pair based question about the scheduled tribes of India. I have framed this question because in December 2022 the Narikurava and Hatti tribes were added to the scheduled tribes list. Here all the four pairs are correctly matched so the correct answer is option D all four pairs. Now we will discuss some basic information about Narikurava and Hatti tribes in prelims perspective. Nari Kuravar literally translates to Nari jackal and Kuravar men. They are called Nari Kuravar because men of this community were skilled in trapping the jackals. They are also known by another name Kuruvi Karan. Kuruvi means paro Karan man. Again this term denotes their skillful hunting methods. They are a semi nomadic tribe. Presently, majority of the Nari Kuravar tribe reside in Tamil Nadu. Their language is known as Vagri Boli, which is a mixture of Marathi, Telugu, and Tamil. Know that it doesn't have a script. It is classified as Indo-Aryan language. Historically, these tribes were involved in fox hunting, as their name signifies. However, since hunting was outlawed in India. the group's main occupation became selling homemade beaded jewelry and traditional toys now let's see about hatti tribes the word hatti comes from hat which means a shop the community got their name from their tradition of selling home grown vegetables crops meat and wool in the huts the hatis mainly dwell in himachal uttarakhand border in the basin of giri and tans river giri and tans are tributaries of river yamuna there is a fairly rigid caste system among the hatis among the hatis the bats and kash are considered the upper caste while the badois are considered lower caste intercaste marriage is not allowed Kumblis are the traditional council of Hatties and they are similar to the Kups of Haryana. Budi Diwali is a 3 day long festival celebrated by the Hatties. People dance and sing with fire lit torches in their hands. Dancers would take cover under a large cloth canopy designed to look like an elephant and dance in unison imitating a warrior sitting on the elephant. This is about Budi Diwali with this information now let's move on to the next question see this is also a pair based question about the temples and dynasty and we have to choose the correctly matched pairs here the first two pairs are correctly matched but mahabodhi temple is built by mauryan dynasty and the konark sun temple is built by the eastern ganga dynasty the correct answer for this question is option b only two pairs see i have framed this question because in december president of india visited the ramappa temple at telangana now we will discuss about the ramappa temple from prelims perspective see the ramappa temple also known as rudreshwara temple was situated in the state of telangana it was constructed in the year 1213 ad during the reign of kakatiyan emperor It was built by Recharla Rudra, a general of the famous Kakatiyan king Ganapati Deva. The temple is dedicated to Lord Shiva. 
Now let's see about the architectural features of this temple. The temple complexes of Kakatiyas have a distinct style, technology and decoration exhibiting the influence of the sculptor. You can see from the image given here that Ramappa temple stands on a raised platform. See, the star-shaped platform is nearly 6 feet high with walls, pillars and ceilings about it. The hall in front of the sanctum has numerous carved pillars that have been positioned to create an effect that combines light and space wonderfully. The temple is named after the sculptor Ramappa who built it, making it the only temple in India to be named after its craftsman. Ramappa temple has a special technological feature called sandbox foundation. So this helped the temple stand tall all these years. Now let's briefly see about this sandbox technique. See, the sandbox technique is a type of foundation involving digging of the earth at least 3 meters deep and later getting it filled with sand. It is reinforced by gravel and other material. Later, huge structures are built on the sand foundation. The utility of sand filled foundation is that it acts as a cushion or shock absorber when earthquake occurs. Thus, it prevents vibrations in the main structure and protects it from falling. That's all for this question. Now we will move on to the next question discussion. See, this is a two statement question and we have to choose the correct statements. I have framed this question because in December 2022, Indian government was on plan to invite bits to extract gold from old mines. Before solving this question, let us discuss some basic information about gold reserves and gold mines in India. See, the total reserves or resources of gold ore in the country have been estimated at 501.83 million tons. This is as per National Mineral Inventory or NMI data of 2015. Now we will look about the gold reserves in India. See. The largest reserves of gold ores are located in Bihar which has 44% followed by Rajasthan with 25%, Karnataka with 21%, West Bengal with 3%, Andhra Pradesh with 3% and Jharkhand with 2%. And also finally the remaining 2% reserves in Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Kerala, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. Now let's see some of the important gold mines in India. Firstly, take the Hati gold mines. It is located in Raichur district of Karnataka and it is the only public sector company producing gold in the country. Now we will look about the Bharat Gold Mines Limited. It is an erstwhile public sector undertaking and it was incorporated in April 1972 under the administrative control of Department of Mines. Its office is at Kolar Gold Fields. The BGML operations became unviable so the operations of BGML were closed from 1st March 2001. Finally, we will look about the Ramgiri gold field in Anantpur district of Andhra Pradesh. This gold field consists of Yappamana and Gantlappa mines, the powerhouse mine and the South Jiputil mine. The extraction in these areas is done by the Deccan Gold Mines Limited. With this information, now let's solve our question. Here statement 1 says that Bigar has the largest reserve of gold ore in India. Statement 2 says that Hetty Gold Mine Company Limited is the only public sector company producing gold in the country. Both these statements are correct. So the answer for this question is option C, both 1 and 2. Now we will move on to the next question. See this question here is about Interstate Water Dispute Tribunal. I have framed this question because recently Supreme Court gave center 3 months to constitute an Interstate River Water Dispute Tribunal. This is to resolve the dispute between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. So there is a chance of asking about the tribunal in this year prelims. Now with this understanding let us solve the question. First statement says that Interstate Water Dispute Tribunal is a constitutional body which provides for the adjudication of disputes relating to 
waters of interstate rivers and river valleys this statement is incorrect just now i said that supreme court gave notice to center for forming interstate river water dispute tribunal so it is not a constitutional body it is formed on a need basis article 262 1 of the indian constitution says that parliament may pass laws to resolve disputes or complaints the disputes mainly rise because of the usage distribution or control of transboundary waters in the river or river valley statement 2 says that interstate water disputes tribunal are formed by central government based on the request of state governments this is correct just now we saw article 261 empowers parliament to pass laws to resolve disputes relating to water accordingly parliament has enacted the interstate water dispute act 1956 under this act the states can approach the center to constitute a tribunal it is for solving interstate water disputes through consultations to say in simple words the interstate water disputes tribunal is established to settle the disputes on water resources between the states like i already said interstate water disputes arise when two or more states disagree about the usage distribution and management of rivers flowing through two or more states know that currently five tribunals are active in india they include ravi and bias water tribunal krishna water disputes tribunal vansadara water disputes tribunal mahadai water disputes tribunal mahanadi water disputes tribunal so the correct answer to the question is option b two only with this information now we will move on to the next question see this question talks about goa warranto to answer this question you should first know about rits so first we will discuss about rits and then we'll get back to the question see rits are a written order from the supreme court or high court that commence constitutional remedies for indian citizens against the violation of their fundamental rights article 32 of the indian constitution deals with constitutional remedies that an indian citizen can seek from the supreme court of india and high courts against the violation of his or her fundamental rights the same article gives the supreme court power to issue writs for the enforcement of rights whereas the high court has the same power under article 226 these are the five types of writs which includes habeas corpus mandamus prohibition certiorari and quo warranto further the parliament can empower any other court to issue these writs in this discussion let us restrict ourselves to quo warranto see the literal meaning of the writ quo warranto is by what authority or warrant supreme court or high court issued this writ to prevent illegal usurpation of public office by a person so through this writ the court inquires into the legality of a claim of a person to a public office remember this writ gives the right to seek redressal to any individual other than the aggrieved person but quo warranto can be issued only when the substantive public office of a permanent character created by a statute or by the constitution is involved it cannot be issued against a private person or ministerial office let's just understand the concept with an example for example a person of 62 years has been appointed to fill a public office whereas the retirement age is 60 years such appointments are unlawful right now even though your fundamental rights are not affected here directly you can file a quo warranto writ petition because the position is created by a statute and does not come under the private or ministerial office so here both the statements are correct correct answer for this question is option c both 1 and 2 now we will move on to the next question see this question talks about rice cultivation in india before answering this question let us quickly go through some important facts about rice cultivation see 
rice is the staple food crop of a majority of people in our country it is a karif crop which requires high temperature generally about 25 degree celsius and high humidity with annual rainfall above 100 cm here karif crop means the crops which are grown between june to november maximum temperature which the crop can tolerate is between 40 degree celsius to 42 degree celsius now coming to the regions of rice cultivation in india rice is grown under widely varying conditions of altitude and climate in our country rice cultivation in india extends from 8 degree to 35 degree north latitude and from sea levels to as high as 3000 meters rice is grown in the plains of north and northeastern india coastal areas and also in the deltaic regions development of a dense network of canal irrigation and tube wells have made it possible to grow rice in areas of less rainfall such as punjab haryana and western uttar pradesh and parts of rajasthan so from this we can see rice is grown all around our country now coming to the leading rice producing states of india as of 2020 to 21 the top 3 rice producing states of india are west bengal uttar pradesh and punjab around 36 percentage of india's total rice production is from these three states west bengal contributed 13.62 percentage of the total rice produced in india then uttar pradesh contributed around 12.81 percentage while Punjab accounted for 9.96 percentage to the total production. Last year we had a question regarding system of rice intensification. Even in 2020 we had a question. So this is an important topic. Now you can pause the video and try to answer the question. Statement 1 says that rice is cultivated only in deltaic regions of India. This statement is incorrect. because we saw that rice is grown in the plains of north and northeastern india coastal areas and also deltaic regions here statement number 2 says that rice is predominantly grown as karif crop in india this statement is correct so the correct answer for this question is option b 2 only now we will move on to the next question see this question talks about wheat cultivation so first we will see about wheat and then we'll get back to the question See wheat is the second important cereal crop. It is the main food crop in north and northwestern part of the country. There are two important wheat growing zones in the country. One is the Ganga Satluj plains in the northwest and other is the black soil region of the Deccan. The major wheat producing states are Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Rajasthan and parts of Madhya Pradesh. You can see them in the image given here. you can go through it now talking about the ideal condition for its cultivation wheat requires a cool growing season and at the time of ripening it needs bright sunshine this rabi crop requires 50 to 75 cm of annual rainfall which is evenly distributed over the growing season and annual rainfall of about 100 cm is the upper limit for its cultivation the ideal temperature at the time of sowing is between 10 degree celsius to 15 degree celsius and at the type of ripening and harvesting it is 21 degree celsius to 26 degree celsius a frost free period of about 100 days is required for its cultivation wheat grows best in a well drained loamy soil particle size distribution of the soil and the relative quantities of the sand silt and clay determines the loamy soil so now read the question first statement says that the optimum temperature during the growing period is around 30 degree celsius this statement is incorrect statement 2 says that a frost free period of about 100 days is required this statement is correct and finally third statement says that wheat needs light clay or heavy loam soil this statement is also correct so the correct answer for this question is option c 2 and 3 only now we will move on to the next question see this question is about agni 5 missile 
three statements are given and we have to find the correct statement. Before we approach this question, let us see some points about Agni 5 missile. Agni 5 is an indigenously built advanced three stage solid fueled surface to surface ballistic missile. It was developed under the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program. It is a land based ballistic missile that is launched from a canister. But what is a ballistic missile? See, ballistic missiles work on the same principle as throwing a stone at a target. What happens when we throw a stone? We exert some force on the stone. The stone continues to rise against gravity until it has some residual force in it. Once the force is exhausted, it falls down due to gravity accelerating along the way. The same thing happens in ballistic missiles. Take Agni 5 missile for example. Agni 5 has a three stage solid fuel engine. When Agni is launched from a canister, the engine ignites. Within a few minutes, all the three stages of Agni 5 will burn up and in that process, it will take the missile to a height of around 250 kilometers. This phase is the booster phase. At the end of the booster phase, all the fuel in the missile's engine will be exhausted and the missile will be placed at a height of 250 km. After this, the ballistic phase begins. In this phase, the nuclear warhead continues to move up due to the momentum and will follow a parabolic path. After reaching a height of around 600 kilometers, the momentum will be exhausted and the nuclear warhead will start moving towards Earth due to the influence of gravity. During this time, course corrections are made to increase the accuracy of the warhead. Finally, the warhead will reach the designated area and cause maximum impact. So this is about the working of ballistic missile. Now coming back to Agni 5. It is capable of striking targets at a range from 5000 km to 8000 km with a very high degree of accuracy. The missile is nuclear capable and carries a nuclear warhead of about 1.5 tons. Look at this map depicting the range of Agni 5 missiles. Its range covers almost all of China. So we have a nuclear capable missile that covers entire China and this is along India's policy of nuclear deterrence. Also, if you notice the range carefully, you can see that some parts of Africa and Europe can be targeted using this missile. So, by using this missile, we can target areas from other continents. This is why Agni 5 is called as Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Russia, US, China, North Korea and India are the only countries currently known to possess land-based ICBMs. Israel has also tested ICBMs but is currently not open about actual deployment. In addition to this, China, France, India, Russia, the UK and the US possess submarine launched ICBMs. Now coming back to this question, from the discussion we had, we know that statement 1 and 2 are correct but statement 3 is incorrect. So the correct answer for this question is option A, 1 and 2 only. Now we will move on to the next question. See, our next question is about airship. The correct answer for this question is option C. It is a common geographic area where pollutants get trapped creating similar air quality. I framed this question because in a recently published report of the World Bank titled Striving for Clean Air, air pollution and public health in South Asia, it was mentioned that India has six large air sheds between which air pollutants move. So this year we can expect a question from air sheds. So as a part of this question discussion, let us revise about air sheds. As per the World Bank definition, an air shed is a common geographic area where pollutants get trapped creating similar air quality for everyone. As we already saw, airshed indicates a region having a common flow of air. 
so if one place emits greenhouse gas then the air quality of other places will also be affected there are six air sheds in south asian region as per the report i have displayed the six air sheds here you can go through it moving forward we will see the relationship between air shed and air pollution in south asia air pollutants travel long distances within south asia this means that the air pollutants will cross municipal state and even national boundaries this is because of the existence of a common flow of air or air sheds in the region so because of this air sheds only pollutants travel to other regions the report says that in many cities such as dhaka kathmandu and colombo only one third of the air pollution originates within the city so the remaining air pollution comes from the neighboring places and this is about the role of air shed in air pollution with this brief understanding about air sheds now let's move on to the next question look at this question here this question is about the battle of vandi wash or vandavasi now before answering the question let us learn some points about the battle of vandi wash first of all know that the battle of vandi wash was part of the third carnatic war see there were three carnatic wars fought between the colonial powers of french and british the first carnatic war was fought between 1740 to 1748 while the second carnatic war was fought between 1749 to 1754 and the third carnatic war was fought between 1758 and 1763 let's not get deep into three carnatic wars we will focus our discussion on the battle of vandi wash as i said earlier the battle of vandi wash was part of the third carnatic war the battle of vandi wash was fought in the year 1760 and it was fought between the french and the british The British army was led by Comte de Lally and the British army was led by Sir Eyre Good. Now, what was the cause of the battle? See, in 1758, the French army under Comte de Lally captured the English forts of St. David and Vijayanagaram. This made the British angry. Then in the year 1760 the French army tried to acquire the fort of Vandavasi this eventually triggered the british to heavily fight with the french so the battle happened at Vandavasi or Vandivash know that Vandivash is located in present day Tiruvannamalai district of Tamil Nadu see in the battle the french forces were badly defeated by the british forces and the french lost all their possessions in india after the war the treaty of paris was signed between the french and the british as per the treaty pondicherry karekal and mahe were restored to the french under the protection of the british although the treaty restored their factories the political influence of the french disappeared in india after the battle of vandivash and this paved the way for the british to establish its strength throughout india now let us approach this question here the statement one says that it was fought between the colonial powers of british and the french this statement is correct statement number 2 says that the outcome of the battle was the treaty of pondicherry which restored some territories to the french the statement is incorrect it is the treaty of paris and not pondicherry so the correct answer for this question is option a one only now we will move on to the next question look at this question here a paragraph is given about a particular plant disease you have a couple of neem trees in your back garden one fine rainy morning you notice a strange infection or blight in the tips of the twigs and branches upon inspection you notice that it is a fungal infection later the blight spreads to the inflorescence you contact your local krishi vigyan kendra and ask for expert opinion people at the krishi vigyan kendra inform you that there is no cure your only option is to prune and stop further spread what is the plant disease that is mentioned in this paragraph the disease that is described in this particular paragraph is dieback disease so the correct answer is option b 
आई फ्रेंड दिस क्वेश्चन बिकॉज लास्ट ईयर देर वॉज न्यूज अबाउट ट्विक ब्लाइट और डाई बैक डिजीज अफेक्टिंग नीम ट्रीज इन तेलंगाना नाउ एज अ पार्ट ऑफ दिस डिस्कशन लेट एस सी सम पॉइंट अबाउट द डाई बैक डिजीज से डाई बैक रेफर्स टू द प्रोग्रेसिव डेथ ऑफ ट्विक्स एंड ब्रांचेस इट कैन बी सीन इन मेनी ट्रीज एंड प्लांट्स one of the characteristics of dieback disease is that the infection generally starts at the tips it is a fungal infection this infection is caused by the pathogen called pombopsis acidirachte the disease mainly affects the neem trees the occurrence of dieback of neem was first reported from new forests of dehradun in 1980s now coming to the symptoms the symptoms of the disease include first is twig blight but what is a blight when a plant or part of the plant rapidly collapses and dies it is called blight commonly blight means spotting discoloration wilting or destruction of leaves flowers stems fruits or entire plant you can look at this image for reference the next one is inflorescence blight here inflorescence is a cluster of flowers on a branch so the inflorescence blight means infection in flowers and branches that have flowers and finally fruit rot it is said that the disease results in almost 100% loss of fruit production the disease is more prominent during august to december the appearance of symptoms starts with the onset of the rainy season it becomes severe in the later part of the rainy season and early winter these are some of the symptoms of the disease now how to manage this infection see according to experts management operation should start from the nursery rising itself it is because the pathogen that is responsible for the infection is both seed borne and seed transmitted so during sowing seed treatment with fungicides or biocontrol agents will reduce the infection these measures help to impart resistance against diseases these measures come under prevention measures but after infection pruning operations should be done this is to remove the diseased twigs and it should be burnt this is done to stop the further spread during the next season these are some points that you should know about the dieback disease now we will move on to the next question look at this question here this question is about the gst council we have to find the correct statements now before answering the question let us learn some points about the gst council see first of all know that GST was introduced in India by the 101st Constitutional Amendment Act of 2016 and it came into effect from 1st of July 2017 the GST replaced existing multiple taxes levied by the central and state governments know that the tax rates rules and regulations under the GST are governed by the GST council see the gst council is a constitutional body as it was created under article 279a of indian constitution now talking about the composition the gst council is chaired by the union finance minister then the members of the council include the union state minister of revenue or finance and ministers in charge of finance or taxation of all the states know that the union territories with the legislatures like delhi puducherry and jammu and kashmir are also represented in the gst council as members of the council now we will see the quorum of the gst council see the quorum is the minimum number of members who must be present at the meetings of the council to make the proceedings of that meeting valid the quorum of the gst council shall be one half of the total number of members that is 50 percentage and know that every decision of the gst council is taken by a majority of not less than 3/4 of the weighted votes of the members present and voting here the central government has the weightage of 1/3 of the total value and the state governments would have a weightage of 2/3 of the total votes cast 
Now talking about the functions of the GST Council, as per Article 279A4, the GST Council makes recommendations to the Union and the States on important issues related to GST. Apart from this, the Council also decides on the various slab rates on the GST and it also governs the place of supply and threshold limits. Additionally, the Council recommends special rates for raising additional resources during natural calamities or disasters. Then, the Council also recommends special provisions for certain states. Note one important point here, as per the Supreme Court's ruling, the recommendations of the GST Council are not binding on either the Union Government or the State Governments. Now let's approach the question. Here first statement says that it is a statutory body constituted under the Central Goods and Service Tax Act 2017. This statement is incorrect. It is a constitutional body. Statement 2 says that it makes decision about various rate slabs of the goods and service taxes. This statement is correct. Statement 3 states that the recommendations of the GST Council are binding on the central government and the state governments. This statement is incorrect. As we saw just now, the recommendations are not binding on the government. The correct answer for this question is option B, 2 only. Now we will move on to the next question. See, this question reads, INS Vishagapatnam, INS Mormogao, INS Impal and INS Surat are related to which of the following naval defense vessels of India? Option A, steel guided missile frigates. Option B, advanced missile corvettes. Option C, next generation steel guided missile destroyers. Option D, amphibious assault vessels. The correct answer for this question is option C, next generation steel guided missile destroyers. Now let us see some important points about destroyers of the Indian Navy. Basically a destroyer is a type of warship. See there are many types of warships present in our country like aircraft carriers, frigates, corvettes etc. So similar to that the destroyer is also a type of warship. See the destroyer is quite large and fast moving. Know that if the destroyers have anti-missile capabilities then we call them as missile destroyers. Now coming to the destroyers of Indian Navy. Currently the Indian Navy operates more than 10 guided missile destroyers from four classes namely Vishagapatnam class, Kolkata class, Delhi class and Rajput class. See last December the second destroyer under Vishagapatnam class that is INS Mormugao was commissioned into the Indian Navy. So now we will focus our discussion on Vishagapatnam class alone. See the destroyers under the Vishagapatnam class are being built under project 15B. Know that project 15B was launched for constructing next generation steel guided missile destroyers for the Indian Navy. The destroyers under Project 15B are designed in-house by the Directorate of Naval Design and they are built at the Masagon Dock Shipbuilders Limited in Mumbai. So we can say that the destroyers built under Project 15B are indigenous. See, under Project 15B, four destroyers were planned and they are named after major cities such as Vishagapatnam, Mormugao, Impal and Surat. See, INS Vishagapatnam is the first destroyer developed under Project 15B and that's why we call the entire warships under Project 15B as Vishagapatnam class destroyers. Know that INS Vishagapatnam was commissioned already in 2021 and in December 2022, INS Mormugao was commissioned into the Indian Navy. The INS Impal is now undergoing sea trials and INS Surat is under construction. Now talking about the specifications, the Vishagapatnam class destroyers are propelled by four powerful gas turbines. So this helps the destroyer to achieve a speed in excess of 30 knots. Apart from this, the destroyers have enhanced stealth features. See, 
being stealth means low observability by enemies because of this feature only we call visakhapatnam class destroyers as stealth guided missile destroyers additionally the destroyers are equipped with brahmos cruise missiles and long range surface to air missiles it is also said that the destroyers are equipped to fight under nuclear biological and chemical warfare condition that's all now we will move on to the next question see this question talks about the exchange rate systems so first we will revise few facts about the exchange rate system and then we will get back to this question see the exchange rate of a currency is determined by the supply and demand for the country's currency in the international foreign exchange market for example if the demand for dollar increases then its value increases and the dollar appreciate while indian rupee depreciates with respect to the dollar because earlier you were buying 1 dollar for 65 rupees and now you are buying the same for 70 rupees but how did the dollar suddenly cost higher because dollar is used by many countries for import export purpose and if there is sudden increase in imports and the country has to pay for it in dollars then it will buy dollars in the market and the demand for dollar increases so this is how exchange rate works see different governments use different ways to manage their exchange rates we'll see what are they first is a fixed or pegged exchange rate system here the central bank has complete intervention in the determination of the exchange rate this is done by linking the domestic currency to the value of gold or with other major currencies such as us dollar for instance the central bank itself decides the exchange rate of local currency example 1 dollar is equal to 50 rupees then second is the floating or flexible exchange rate system here the exchange rate is determined by the market forces of demand and supply the central bank does not intervene so if there are more number of indian people who wants to import goods from us compared to the number of americans who were interested to buy indian goods then demand for dollars will be more than that of rupees so now from 1 dollar is equal to 50 rupees it goes up to 70 rupees third system is the managed floating rate system this is now adopted by most countries including india it is the middle path between the fixed exchange rate regime and the floating exchange rate regime in the system the exchange rate of rupee is allowed to move freely based on the market forces however during difficult circumstances the central bank intervenes to stabilize the exchange rate by selling or buying the reserves so if there is more demand for dollars during an exceptional situation then the rbi will sell its reserve of dollars in the market thereby pulling down the demand for dollars now we will take up the question here first statement says that in fixed exchange rate system there is less interference by the central bank whereas in the floating exchange rate system there is more interference this statement is incorrect in the fixed exchange rate system the central bank interferes and in the floating system it is basically market based and there is less interference statement 2 says that increased demand for rupee with respect to dollar in international market will cause depreciation of the currency value this statement is incorrect because here when the demand for rupee increases in the market it means there is appreciation in its value and not depreciation the question asks for incorrect statement so the correct answer for this question is option c both 1 and 2 now we will move on to the next question look at this question here it talks about the nilgiri tar before solving the question let's learn about nilgiri tar and then we'll take up the question See this animal is considered as a pride of western ghats. The nilgiri tar is the only mountain hoofed mammal in southern India amongst the 12 species present in India. It is basically the sole caprinae species found in the tropical mountains of southern India. Note that this endemic species of the western ghats is listed as 
endangered in the IUCN red list of threatened species and is protected under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act of india 1972 now coming to its habitat it is found in the open mountain grassland habitats at elevations from 1200 to 2600 meter of the southwestern ghats currently the nilgiri thar distribution is along a narrow stretch of 400 kilometer in the western ghats between nilgiris in the north and kanyakumari hills in the south of the region here you should know that the Eravikulam National Park in Anemalai Hills of Kerala is the home to the largest population of the Nilgiri Thar. See, the animal faces multiple threats from both natural and man-made factors. As we know, habitat loss due to deforestation is shrinking their area of habitation. Then, there is competition with domestic livestock, hydroelectric projects in Nilgiri Thar habitat and monoculture plantations. The animal is occasionally hunted for its meat and skin. Now we will take up the question. Statement 1 says that the Nilgiri Thar comes under endangered category of the IUCN red list. The statement is correct. Statement 2 says that it comes under schedule 2 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. The statement is incorrect. We saw that it comes under schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act. Statement 3 says that it is the state animal of Kerala. No. It is a state animal of Tamil Nadu. So, the right answer for this question is option A, one only. Now, we will move on to the next question. See, this question talks about the Sikh Gurus. In this discussion, we will learn about Guru Gobind Singh and then we will try to solve this question. See, Guru Gobind Singh was the 10th and last Sikh Guru. When his father and the 9th Sikh Guru, Teg Bagadur, was executed by Aurangasib, Guru Gobind Singh was formally installed as the leader of the Sikhs at the age of 9, becoming the 10th and final human Sikh Guru. His four biological sons died during his lifetime, two in battle and two executed by the Mughal governor Wazir Khan. The two sons namely Baba Soravar Singh and Baba Fateh Singh were forced to convert to Islam by Aurangasib's men. When the young children declined, they were executed. To commemorate the valor of these young children only, Virbal Divas was celebrated and that's why this made to the news. Now coming to the contribution of Guru Gobind to the Sikh religion, he was the Guru who organized the Sikh community into a warrior class called the Khalsa. Guru Gobind Singh created and initiated the Khalsa as a warrior community with a duty to protect the innocent from religious persecution. The founding of the Khalsa started a new phase in the Sikh tradition. It formally formulated an initiation ceremony and rules of conduct for the Khalsa warriors. Additionally, the Khalsa provided political and religious vision for the Sikh community. And also know that the concept of five case was introduced by him. He commanded the Khalsa Sikhs to wear five case. They are Kesh, which is unshorn hair and beard. Kanga, comb for the Kesh, usually it is wooden. Kirpan, small curved sword of any size, shape or metal. Then Kachera, which means short breeches. Then Kara, a bracelet, usually made of iron or steel, worn on the wrist. See, these five Ks need to be worn by a practicing Sikh all the time. This concept was introduced by Guru Gobind Singh to distinguish Sikhs from the other people and also to instill a sense of brotherhood among Sikhs themselves. Now we will take up the question. See, the question asks us to arrange the Sikh Gurus chronologically. If you had paid attention to the discussion, you would have got that Guru Dek Bahadur was the father of Guru Gobind Singh who was the ninth Guru. So, two must be at the last. In this way, you can eliminate option C and D. Then, to come to the correct answer, you need to know that Guru Arjan Dev was before Guru Hargobind. Yes, Guru Arjan Dev was the fifth Sikh Guru while Guru Hargobind was the sixth. As you all already know, the first Sikh Guru was Guru Nanak. So, the correct answer for this question is option B. 
Now we will take up the next question. This question is about the tribal groups in northeastern India. We have taken up this question because in December there was a news article about the land deeds that were handed over to the heads of Bodo families in the Chardua Reserve Forest. So in this context, we will first learn about Bodo tribes and then we will come back to this question. See, Bodos are an indigenous tribe that inhabits Assam. They are also called as Boro. The Bodo Kachari is an umbrella term for all the tribal communities. Bodo Kacharis is a name used by anthropologists and linguists to define a collection of ethnic groups living predominantly in the northeastern states of Assam, Tripura and Meghalaya. And this Bodo tribe is one among them. They are mostly located in and around the Brahmaputra River Valley. Bodos were one of the earliest settlers of Assam and today they are one of the largest ethnic groups in the state. Now coming to their different characteristics, firstly the language of Bodos. They speak the Bodo language. They are different from the Assamese language. It is a language of the tibeto burman origin. It is one of the official languages of Assam and it is also one of the language in the 8th schedule. Secondly, the religion of Bodos. They practice Bataoism. It is the traditional religion of Bodos. This involves worshipping of Batao Bhavai and a Sijau tree. The Sijau is a kind of succulent that grows really tall. Thirdly, the food habits of Bodo. Rice is the stable food for the Bodos. Along with that, they also consume variety of vegetables, meat or fish curry. Fourthly, the family system of Bodos. The Bodo society follows patriarchal system. The father is head of the family and is the sole authority and complete owner of the household property. According to the traditional customs, only sons are entitled to inherit the paternal property. In the absence of son, daughters inherit the property. Finally, about the marriage system, the principal form of marriage in the Bodo society is monogamy with some exceptional cases of polygamy. Polyandry is absent in the Bodo society. Polyandry is nothing but marriage of a woman to two or more men at the same time. The dowry system is not known among the Bodo society but some bride family give gifts as a token of love to their daughter. Know that premarital sexual relationship is strictly prohibited, adultery is considered serious sin and offense in the society, then the practice of child marriage is also not prevalent in the Bodo society. Apart from this, marriage within their relatives is also not allowed. Now we will take up the question, which among the following are the particularly vulnerable tribal groups of the Northeast India? See, Maram Nagas and Ryangs are the only tribes listed as particularly vulnerable tribal groups from Northeast India. This is because in the Northeast region, entire population is tribal population. One of the important criteria for identification of PVTGs is declining or stagnant population. So only many PVTGs are not from Northeast. So the correct answer for this question is option A, 1 and 2 only. With this, we have come to the end of this video. If you have found a video to be useful, like the video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel. Happy learning!